Well, greetings everyone and welcome to this week's resuscitation video clip. This is going to be from the resuscitation 2011 conference and you're going to be hearing from an outstanding speaker, Dr. Rich Cantor. Rich is probably one of the most, if not the most well-known pediatric emergency physician speaker uh, in the country and he speaks at many, many international conferences as well. He's received just about every educational award you can possibly imagine. He's a a speaker every year at ASEP and the Pediatric uh, ASEP Assembly and on and on. So anyway, uh, in this particular lecture, Rich was talking about neonatal emergencies and we're just gonna focus in on that section of his lecture that spoke about vascular access because that is certainly a harrowing topic in these tiny, tiny little kids. Uh, how in the world do you get vascular access when you really need it? So that's what we're gonna focus in on, probably five, 10 minutes or so. And so Rich, go ahead and take it away. This is a, a joy for me to be here. Uh, Deku and Suge run a tight meeting. I like the fact that it's a half hour format because we can get to the point. Um, I only do children. I, I don't like adults. Uh, they're really despicable people. You know, Rich doesn't mince words at all. But uh, he's a smart guy. You know, I, I worked overnight last night. It was a Saturday night, and it was a full moon. And when I think back to the patients I saw last night, you know, I got to admit, I think he's right. My first talk is on uh, the stabilization of the critical infant and child. So let's get started with a nightmare, a critically ill infant. A six-week-old presents with one-day history of poor feeding and respiratory distress. Uh, he's afebrile, he's tachycardic at 160, hypotensive at 50 over 30, and his SATs are low. This is the standard case. He's got cool extremities, his cap refill is uh, delayed, all peripheral and central pulses are weak, he's grunting with retractions and poor air entry, and he has no murmur. So if you take a look at him, uh, probably he, he's flunking all vast basic points of his physiologic status, ABC. So the case discussion here is, is he an uncompensated shock? Yes. Do we have to intervene? Yes. Number two, I don't know why he's there. He's six weeks and he's, I don't have an etiology. The beauty of neonatology and the curse is there's not many historical clues you can go with. You, you know, it's not like he had a chronic health history. You do a birth history, feeding history, what are the responsibilities of age? There's not much to talk about. Is he septic? Everyone is septic under two months until proven otherwise. Is he hypovolemic? Well, you can take a quick history, not feeding, not drinking, pooping, vomiting, diarrhea, whatnot. Is he cardiogenic shock? Well, anybody can be, and in this age range, it's up there because in peds, although most, nearly 99% of shock is not cardiogenic, if it is gonna show up, it's a neonatal moment. Accompanying respiratory failure is a secondary event. So as EM people, your first feeling with this kind of child is, oh my God, what do I do? Well, the joke is, you know what to do. You just have to downsize your efforts in a little bit. So let's go through the steps. And I'm going to start with vascular access because I'm going to point out why in a second. Number one, anything you do necessitates access, mostly sedation. And we're going to talk about that. What is available? The usual sites. I think all of us are completely familiar with the saphenous vein and back of the hand and all the usual spots. And how many of you start IVs on babies? We're spoiled rotten now. We've become uh, eunuchs, male and female. In my old school world, which is of no use to anyone, uh, we used to do tons of IVs, but now it's done by ancillary personnel, probably better than we do. But there's going to come a moment where they call you in because they can't get it, which is kind of sad, uh, but something that we have to deal with. So I want to talk about the scalp. How many of you have started a scalp IV? Okay. What do you tell the parents about wanting to start it up there? They freak out because, you know, it doesn't seem like what they came in for. Um, the scalp is wonderfully accessible if a child is bald, but there are children with a lot of hair and we've actually shaved them. The scalp veins are looked, looked upon as completely wonderful peripheral access and you know where they are. If you take another look here with the classic rubber band, I can point with this, yeah. The rubber band on the scalp uh, you can see tremendously distended vessels in the frontal vein and also the temporal vein. It's pretty classic. And here's some other ones. Here's one with the uh, catheter. And you can put a 22 angio in there, 
no problem, a 24 for sure, and with some tape and, and blotting, it's really a perfect axis. And it's away from the action. If you were doing chest compressions or whatnot, it's not so bad. So scalp veins, totally worthwhile, worth looking at. Parents are grateful that you don't keep sticking the child. And often, if you go in the room, um, you'll have that as an available site because everybody will have slapped the hands and put 12 holes in the baby's hands and feet. I like doing it because it's way old school in my residence. I don't impress my residents anymore, and they get a little impressed when they see that happen. Um, but it, I, I think it's a valued thing. All right. I think those uh, scalp veins are kind of strange, but um, it's worth having that extra technique in your back pocket. By the way, don't forget to remove that rubber band tourniquet. Number two, the I.O. approach. How many of you have put I.O.s in? Raise your hands. How many of you have put them in talking, walking, breathing patients? Okay. It's very hard to get your head around putting an I.O. in someone who's alive. In all seriousness, we're so used to CPR events with, uh, with IOs. The interosseous approach, I think everyone here is, is amenable to the tibial approach. Here's the standard thing. This is done with an easy IO. I'm no, I have no payoff here. I'd rate that a two. What? Yeah, that's definitely a two. You've all done that? Has any, who uses this product? I, a good product. I'm not endorsing it. I won't even say the name again. Um, the I.O. approach is reasonable. Um, the old school thinking is also reasonable. Another way, here's an injectable dye-related view of the I.O. approach, and it shows, you can see the spread and how quickly the I.O. infused radio-labeled dye goes up through the femur into central circulation. So this is a non-discussion. This is one of the more bizarre things. This poor woman is a pharmaceutical rep for the company that makes this. And I've seen this. Uh, when they demo their product, often their reps take a hit. Well, 50 for getting the needle today, too. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I can use bilateral. I'm going to put my name in sales. <laughs> it'll be all set. Right. Well, I thought you meant she was going to charge you 12 dollars This is dedication. <laughs> OK, ready, go. Needle stick, poke. Okay, I think that's really whacked. Um, I know that Diku said, or I don't know, maybe in Suj, if anybody will let me do that to them and get a free sweatshirt here today, too. I was at a meeting where they, I saw that, and you know, that, I was a little creeped out. Anyway, IOs work. Don't be hesitant. Don't waste time. Get it done and you can get tremendous venous access. Here's another approach, uh, and this is difficult, but I put it in there to show you something, the umbilical venous approach. The umbilical vein has two arteries in one vein, the umbilical stump, rather. And under two weeks of age, it is accessible. It is completely cannulatable, because it's still patent, <coughs> centrally. In essence, you can slide a catheter up there. And uh, you'll see this in the slides, you can see how it's done. I cannot tell you how easy this is, because the cord at that age, under two weeks, but out of the first three, four days of age, is quite stiff and stands at attention when you trim it. And you can often cannulate with the kit, an umbilical venous kit, the umbilical uh, vein. If you take a look how it's done here, you can see it stands at attention, is open for business, and you can slide it in three to four centimeters, and you've accessed the central circulation. This is the obligatory atom picture, and here's the central line going up. You will not go too far because the liver will stop you. I'm not going to dwell on the anatomy. Uh, I can't tell you how easy this is as well. If you want to stock an umbilical vein catheter tray in your ED, if you see a lot of kids, do it. If you're in a community setting, get IOs, bottom line. OK, so let's uh, summarize what we got. With, when you have the crashing neonate and you really need that quick IV access, you've got a few options. If you can't get the normal peripheral vein, You've got three options. You've got the scalp vein, you've got the intraosseous access, and by the way, don't try that at home. That was just crazy. Uh, and then third, you've got the umbilical vein, and this is something I always forget. When you've got the umbilical stump in that first week or so, you've got two arteries and one vein. The vein is more irregular in shape and it's larger. That's where you put the catheter. You insert the catheter about three to four centimeters and you should be able to infuse uh, quite a bit of fluid as necessary. It's a great 
source of uh, venous access uh, in these really, really sick kids. So my thanks to Rich Cantor for this lecture. We'll come back and do some more Rich Cantor in an upcoming VCAST, but you can catch Rich Cantor at the Resuscitation 2013 conference, May 1st through May 5th at the Encore Hotel in Las Vegas. Hope to see you there, and you will see Rich Cantor and a whole bunch of other great pediatric emergency medicine speakers there as well. Take care, and bye for now.